The following program, Such as Life, The Ben Cousins Story, is an open look at the effect illegal drug use has had on the life of Ben Cousins. The program includes images and discussion of a strength and intensity which Channel 7 believes warrants additional parental discretion if being viewed by very young viewers. The following program is classified M. It contains drug use and some coarse language. Prime recommends viewing by mature audiences. Good evening, I'm Hamish McLaughlin and welcome to part two of Such Is Life. Joining me shortly to briefly discuss the fallout from part one will be leading football journalist Mike Sheehan, the director of the documentary Paul Goldman and the CEO of the Australian Drug Foundation, John Rogerson. Immediately following part two tonight, I'll be joined by Ben's father, Brian, to discuss all of the aspects of his son's battle. Adolescent psychologist Michael Cargreg, the man that gave Ben the lifeline, Terry Wallace, the Richmond Football Club CEO, Brendan Gale, as well as Adrian Anderson from the AFL. We'll talk to Adrian about how Ben beat the AFL drug testing system. We hope it's both educational and helpful. If you didn't get a chance to see part one of Such Is Life last night, here's what you missed. I expect you to... You know, live like a priest all week and fight like the devil on the weekend. I started using recreational illicit drugs when I was 17 or 18. I was going to absolutely annihilate and launch into as much drugs as I could. Today is war and I will leave nothing left on that pitch because by doing that, I allow myself the ultimate reward. I'm a drug addict. Just flat out. When Ben got suspended by the West Coast Eagles, he went on a massive bender for about six days. I mean, I'll be quite frank, I thought, yeah, he could kill himself. At times, went home and thought, oh my God, he's going to die. He's going to die. And have I done enough? Has Brian done enough? I mean, I'm not ashamed of Ben and I'm not embarrassed about what happened. But my regret is that as a parent of four children, I, I knew absolutely nothing about drugs. I knew nothing, none of the warning signs to, to look for. It was a big confronting hour of television and the water cooler ch chat today has all been about Ben, Brian and the family. Before we go to part two of Such Is Life, to talk through the impact of last night, three men from three very different walks of life. Concerned parent and leading journalist in this country, Mike Sheehan from Fox Sports on the couch. Great to have you on board. Thanks, Hamish. What a day. I mean, the, the build-up was, was massive and the impact was even bigger. Yeah, it was a very big day. CEO of the Australian Drug Foundation, John Rogerson. Thanks, Hamish. It's good to be here and good to see the second part of Ben's journey. And the director of Such Is Life, Paul Goldman. Yeah, great to be here. There's been so many diverse opinions today. Mike, you've been in this caper for a very, very long time. In fact, how long? 40 years, Hamish. Has there ever been a bigger story than this? Two million people watched it last night. Yeah, massive numbers. I thought when, uh, after Wayne Carey's dramatic exit from North Melbourne, that I'd never see a bigger story than that. 14 pages of the Herald Sun, the Wayne Carey story. And uh, it's been trumped. Well, a lot of pages have been written and the radio stations have had a lot to talk about. If you've missed it, here's just a taste of today's action. Yeah, I watched it with our two daughters, mate. They're 13 and 14. And I think it was a, like a real eye-opener for them. I, I just admire the, that he's got the strength to try and overcome, you know, his addiction and to try and live a normal life. They say they're not uh, performance-enhancing, but they are because they give them offence, uh, this sense of that they can do no wrong, they think they can fly. He wasn't taking drugs actively the day before or when he was playing, but how about when he was training? I mean, they're the hard yards right there. I thought it was a fascinating account of how this happened to one person. I thought it was crap. I thought it was facile. I thought it was gratuitous. I don't like Ben Cousins. Sorry, I've never met him. I don't like what I've seen of him. I watched that documentary last night. It showed Ben Cousins as a cocky, spoiled, self-indulgent brat. They didn't show the dark, gloomy side, the stuff where a normal person out there, a normal family goes through. The main theme that was coming through on that was about how gorgeous he was and what a party animal he was, and, and that was all that they were really interested in. I'm a little bit confused. I don't understand why you wouldn't let your children watch it. Wouldn't you use it? as an education to them rather than censor it? Do you think they can't read a newspaper? I would recommend this show to watch as a family and to watch it and show your children. Educational, <laughs> glamour boy, no remorse, not contrite. Mike, it is polarised. Well, it was always going to polarise opinions, but I cannot understand people pushing the line of glamorised drug use. I mean, here we've seen Ben Cousins shamed and arrested. He's lost his mentor and mate in Chris Mainwaring. 
He's blown 10 grand in five days on drugs, lost the captaincy of his footy club and been deregistered, and he's sent his uh, family to the point of emotional despair. I mean, no glamour for me. He's had his father in tears on national television. We'll have Brian in the studio after part two, which is coming up shortly. Did you ever think that you would see something so raw from a footballer? No, I don't think... That's as close as I've ever seen any television show take me to a, a sportsman slash celebrity. I mean, I look at... There are some questions that I would have liked answered, and they may be answered tonight. But, I mean, it was captivating and enthralling, and it was enlightening. I just cannot understand the negativity. And it's, it's only... I think it's in a minority, but those who sort of don't think that we have to learn something from it. Well, Mike, do you, we'll get to your questions in just a moment. The newspapers have had a field day today. Newspaper headlines everywhere. Too young to be captain, it was always going to be a concern. Drug addict, not a drug cheat. I mean, Mike, you've written an article in the Herald Sun today and you talk about wanting answers. Now, we're going to get to the headline in a moment, but you said part one has left a lot of questions unanswered. And you wrote about Ben and you said that how possibly did he get through the system without being caught? We're going to speak to Adrian Anderson on that. I'm looking forward to that. How deep was the drug problem at the West Coast Eagles? Was it a culture or a problem? Uh, well, if we take them in, in order, I mean, I don't know how he beat the drug testing system, but it is the most popular question that I've been asked. Was it a drug problem or a culture? No question it was a culture. No doubt about that at all. What about Epworth a few weeks ago? Caffeine tablets and sleeping tablets. You reckon there's more to it? I didn't believe Ben's answer on that. I just didn't believe that an ambulance would be required to rush someone to hospital after a mix of... Uh, some caffeine tablets to play a game of football and then some sleeping tablets to go to sleep. And finally, will Ben Cousins remain clean? We're not going to know that for a while. That's the most important question of all. Will Ben remain clean? No one knows the answer to that, including Ben. We just all hope that he does. John, let me come to you on this now. It has been polarised. It has polarised. There is a stigma with drugs, guilt and shame. Has this helped people talk about it? Well, it certainly helped people talk about it. I guess the issue that uh, the Australian Drug Foundation were concerned about was the, the shots of Ben using drugs. Ben is a role model, and for young people to see Ben using drugs is, is not the right uh, thing to do in my mind. Paul, you're the producer, the director of this film. Why did Ben, do you think, ask you to make this documentary? Look, I think Ben understood that... Um, I, I think it was therapeutic. For him, I mean, after he'd been deregistered, he started making a documentary with some other guys. I came on 16 months ago. Um, it's clearly therapeutic, and I think he understood in his gut that there was actually a really interesting story to tell here. And I think he, all along, has actually really understood that there might some some good might come from it. You conscious of not glorifying it? Was that a concern for you when you were making? Always a concern. I mean, you know, we had this ongoing debate about whether we were glorifying drug use by including some of that footage in there, but I. I think I think, you know, we live in a culture where kids are exposed and we're all exposed to this relentlessly on television and in movies. Uh, and actually, I think, you know, in some way, we thought it would help to actually identify someone who's real. And I think uh, that was our thinking. Paul, every second person in the country is calling me smug today and bulletproof and invincible. Would he have been better off just crying for 30 seconds, do you think? Would that have helped him? He's a good-looking boy. I think he's paying the price for that. And he seems to have been in control of his emotions. And he's been, he's been marked hard for it, hasn't he? Yeah, I think, I think people... Throughout, I've always wondered, wondered why he hasn't cried. I mean, I, I talked to Ben today and said, you know, perhaps uh, it seems that people don't understand and they want you to say sorry. And, you know, he got very emotional and said, I've put people through hell. Of course mm. I'm sorry. Mm. But, but look, at the end of the day, uh, this just indicates, Mike, uh, how we treat people who use drugs. We judge them really harshly. And we have to stop doing this in our community. They're people just like you and I. And we need to see their, their issues around drugs and their drug problems as health issues. They're not criminal issues. They're not criminals. They're just people. And we need to care and support them. And I think that's really one of the strong things that comes out of this documentary. But if he was emotional today, Paul, talking to you, why wasn't he emotional last night? I think you'll see him being more emotional in part two. Uh, but as Ben says in part two... Yeah. He's a very, very private person. I, mean, I think people can confuse the public persona. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ben's got that cheeky grin. But his mum says he's had it since he was a kid. Um, so I think he's very, very guarded about what he lets out. John, is it glorified drug use? 
Oh, look, there's there's parts of this that in some people's eyes they do, and it does. Uh, look, the, the drug use concerns I think were totally unnecessary. But look, the, the big things here are the opportunity for people to talk about this issue and the opportunity for us as a community to, to stop judging people like Ben so harshly. Mike, I reckon you've got something up your sleeve about the Eagles. Well, look, oh, there's no question in my mind, Hamish, that, that there was a problem existed there uh, and they were happy to turn a blind eye to it while they were such a good side. Now, I think they went to the AFL uh, about two th early 2007 and said it was getting out of hand and they wanted the AFL almost to know about it and then to actually increase the testing at the footy club. But the warning bells were ringing from 2002. Now, I don't want to sound a know-all on this, but I do know that for a fact, that people who had to know what was happening were saying there was a problem involving many players at the West Coast Eagles five or six years before it surfaced. We're going to speak to Brian Cousins about the Eagles and the culture in the West. Twitter and email has gone berserk overnight. Here's just a couple. First one is for you, John. Physical effects on the body. Surely the amount of drugs that Ben has consumed is not good for him physically, in particular his heart, kidney and liver. People suggest that the drug taking is performance enhancing, but surely it's performance hindering. And look, there's no doubt about that. And what we see tonight is quite a different story from Ben. We, we see Ben struggling to train properly. So when we get the context tonight of the first documentary with the second part, people are going to see the impact on his body. And, and look, there's all these other things and, and perhaps contributed to more of his drug use, the anxiety, the depression, the insomnia. So they're all the things that get associated with drug use. How's your website been today? The website's gone off, 450% increase in, in visits. Uh, the phone systems right around the, uh, Australia, uh, for example, direct line in, uh, in Victoria, 15-fold increase in phone calls, lots of parents ringing and lots of people who are using drugs ringing as well. Mike, this Twitter and this email has come in from a lot of people. How on earth can the captain, or any player for that matter, remain untested, undetected and unpunished when using so much? Paul? I think my understanding is dumb luck. That, 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 you know, and a, a bit of connivance, but mostly dumb luck. So 2005, I mean, it blew out from there, didn't it? Didn't it sort of take off in 2005? Um, and the, after the Premiership, I mean, I, the people who I would think should know sort of say that there was, after the Premiership, Ben just was derailed, just went off the rails. Yeah. Yes. Is that a fair I, comment? I, yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, I think people turned a blind eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, this afternoon in Melbourne, this is the headline. Terry Wallace is in tonight after part two of Such Is Life, which is coming up now. I knew Ben was on drugs. He had a hair test. We know about it. He didn't mm -hmm. turn up. They still took him on and it saved his life. Yeah. Look, I, I, Terry's been very honest on several fronts this week. I'm looking forward to talking to him later. Um, look, Richmond should have known that, uh, that he was still on the drugs at the time because they would have done their due diligence as St Kilda and Collingwood had done. And I think we're all pleased that Richmond gave him the chance, but I think they went into it with their eyes wide open. Mike, the good thing. Sorry, Paul. We're going to go to a break, if you don't mind. It's a documentary that has the whole country thinking and talking about this very serious issue. Later tonight in the studio, we'll have a leading adolescent psychologist. We'll have leaders from the club Ben Says Saved His Life, Adrian Anderson from the AFL on how he beat the system, and his father and best mate Brian. First, a warning. What you're about to see contains drug use and coarse language. After the break, part two of Such Is Life, The Troubled Times of Ben Cousins. Hunter. Hi, I'm Ben Cousins. Welcome to part two. Over the years, I've copped a lot of flack for appearing to not care about my behaviour. Tonight you will see just how much pain drug addiction can cause a family. I am deeply sorry for the damage I've caused, and I wouldn't want anyone to go through what my family and I have been through. The message is clear. Drugs ruin lives. I was going to absolutely annihilate and launch into as much drugs as I could. You know, I think a drug addict, I think if people sleep in a cardboard box under a fucking bridge. So not true. By the time the parent finds out, you know, you're in real strife. She said Ben Cousins doesn't look like that. 
And I remember ripping my shirt off. I said, well, he did a week ago. He's been interviewed by police after allegedly abandoning his car in traffic to avoid a breath test. There and then it was in the face of everybody that this kid was just reeling out of control. Ben Cousins shirtless and in the custody of police. What charges? I didn't have any drugs on me. The police knew all about Ben's uh, dodgy friends and Ben's drug activities. I mean, I'll be quite frank, I thought, you know, he could kill himself. Ben, 28 days, is that enough to recover from your problem? I hope so. Yeah, I was drug free. You're not going to go to rehab in any other state. We've got a three-strike policy on drugs, and here's a bloke who hasn't tested positive once, absolutely killing our image. And when you kill the AFL image, they kill you. You slide back slowly and find yourself back to where you started. I didn't know, you know, if I was going to lose Ben or we are going to lose my dad. These people don't care about me. These people do not care about whether they find me hanging from the boom. They don't know. care whether I'm a fucking, whether I get back on the drugs, whether I end up dead. They do not care one bit. If he saw it, you know, breaking me down, um, I just believed that it would be one of the things that turned him around. That's why I did it. My name's Ben Cousins. Uh, today is the 16th of March and I'm 30 days clean. Good. Those knuckles, those I've been suspended for 12 months. I've knuckles. been dealt with under the term bringing the game into disrepute. You know, it's a long way from being punished under the drugs policy. And I think that's the AFL's way of being able to deal with me and remove me from the game for an extended period. I'm 30 days clean. That's a significant day or a milestone day for myself and, and the people that uh, working their way through a drug issue. All these people without a job. I'm one of them. <laughs> this winter I'm going to do a few trips throughout the course of the year and get busy doing all the things that I haven't been able to do rather than sit around and, and dwell on the one thing I can't. Um, plenty more to life than chasing a bit of leather around. Throughout that year of 2008, there was a lot of safety nets that were no longer there, and I was left to my own devices. You know, left to my own devices, my idea of a holiday is what's got me into this predicament. There'll be critical moments in this next year, you know, for example, all new and all fresh right now, um, very keen to stay clean. I'm enjoying having the time to work through things that I need to work through. Um, you know, I don't... And it's nice to be able to work through them at your own pace, in your own time. Um, we're about 13 hours north of Perth, um, Nalu, uh, on a surfing trip. Yeah, it's pretty, it's very remote. Essentially, it's where the desert meets the ocean. that people have been coming to fish and surf for, you know, I think 25, 30 years. I can come up with a guy, George, who um, has been coming up here pretty much as long as anybody. You know, I, I came back from rehab and I was always looking at doing a surf trip. You know, I'd always heard about Nalu and had never been able to come up here because of the seasons sort of overlapping with football. 
you know, through Billy Mitchell, um, who's a good friend of my old man's that comes up every year. I was introduced to George, and, um, you know, George being the big hearted person he is, extended me an invitation to come up. We, we got them up here in uh, George's camp, which we renamed Camp Rehab for the fortnight. He was training up here every day and he was supremely fit. I've never seen a, a fitter athlete than what he was up here. Um, but yeah, he, he, was, he was not a young man with any inner peace. The, you know, when the big problem with Ben is his inner peace, there, there's just none there and he's a long way from it. And until he finds that, um, he, he's going to have some real struggles. His whole adult life has been driven by receiving until he learns the, the joy of giving, learns uh, his spiritual base uh, through meditation. That might be his own spiritual base, whatever it is, and sees how fortunate we all are. That's where he should be going, not to Melbourne and not to be part of the AFL scene. You know, when I set out, <laughs> Um, my career and my drug taking, you know, I didn't intend to hurt anyone. There was no malice in, in what I was doing, but, you know, aside from that, innocent people have been hurt, and in particular the old man, because he sort of he carries a lot of this around and um, takes a lot of it on board, a lot of worry and concern, and he doesn't necessarily know what to do with it, but I know it affects him. Brian saw the press, the, the media, as the enemy. He saw the football industry as being hypocritical and football politics steamrolling his son and, and the family without due consideration to the, to the real issues. You knew that if it, if it kept going on, uh, that Brian himself was in danger. Um, of, of imploding. As I said to him, Brian, if, if you can't say, stay strong and if you can't change your, your tactics not to try and deal with everything, is that, that you're going to fall apart. And if you fall apart, the whole thing falls apart because ben, ben needed Brian like oxygen, absolute oxygen. I got halfway through my trip up there after being, you know, a number of weeks clean, um, fit, training. I had an injury in the water uh, where I tore quite severely my hip flexor. It was one of those ones where you could either pull in or ball straighten out, and I was sort of in between. I was in between. I spent six weeks without being able to train, and I think idle hands of the devil's tools and, you know, I found myself, you know, having a drink and then I think having a drink and then getting getting back to my old ways uh, for a month, I think. Um, and you can do a fair bit of damage in a month. You slide back slowly or sometimes quickly and find yourself back to where you started. I think that the relapse itself was probably precipitated by his alcohol use. You know, when he's not using cocaine, he probably drinks in a similar way to when he uses cocaine as well. We were having ongoing discussions in relation to Ben, how he was travelling, what was happening um, over, in the, uh, over in the West. We lost interest over the 08 year, just the stories were getting more horrific. What were you hearing? Oh, just out of control drug use, um, you know, three day benders, parties that were, uh, that were going on, um, uh, spiralling um, drug uh, use. Crack, crack, crack. He didn't want to go back to the family house. 
And I think he, he almost sort of fought against it initially. But um, I think when the chips were really down, he realised that he wasn't able to stop. Initially, I was surprised. I thought that him staying here might have been um, a bad decision, but we're all here to support him, which we're his biggest fans, I guess, um, to help him through it. He was staying at home and he, he had drugs here and, you know, he was using. And we were aware of that because we, you know, thought it was part... And at that stage, we were following some advice that, you know, he was trying to control his use. Early on during that period, I, I was still very unaware of the destruction and heartache that I was putting some really good people through. He looked at his face and it wasn't him. He looked like a little boy. A lot of the time he looked very scared, um, frightened, um, which is, um, you know, it's hard to see when you see, you know, it's your older brother and he just, he, doesn't know where to go. He um, he gets really like he has bad anxiety attacks. Um, I mean, he's taking drugs, but doesn't look like he's having much fun. I think Ben had been out, and I knew he was up to something. And we were obviously living together at the time. I would ring him, and until he came home, I would you know ring him every thirty minutes, and he would ask for more time. Anyway, he finally came home with. A guy I didn't know, so I immediately just look at, looked at him as if he, you know, was up to something with this guy. And I could see the other guy looking at me funny. And Ben was bent down over his bag and he was, um, you know, going through it. And I could just see his hands grabbing onto something and it was, um, it was something wrapped up in a T-shirt. So I just snatched it and, um, and ran into the bathroom and tried to lock it so he could come in. I um, obviously realised it was um, uh, his glass pipe. Um, anyway, I didn't want to give it back to him. I just kept yelling at him. Anyway, I told him I was going to break it and he just told me it was someone else's and obviously it wasn't. Um, and then I uh, gave it back to him, <laughs> which is a bit um, stupid, but I thought if, if I... Um, whether I gave it back to him or not, it wasn't going to, wasn't going to change anything. Um. <laughs> we were doing shift work, staying up with him right through the night, and about half past three, I was trying to get to sleep, and my wife came up and said, "Oh, Ben's off quickly," and she was almost frantic. And I raced downstairs, and he was—he was all dressed and had his bag. And I stopped the door. I said, "No, you're not going anywhere, mate. And it's the closest we've ever come to blows." And he was frantic. Um, he desperately had to go. And I said, "We're only going to, you know, to get some drugs." And, and he said, "Well, I am." And he said, you know you can't stop me, go. If I want to go, you can't stop me. And uh, if, if I tried to stop him, we would have had a physical confrontation. And I made the decision then to offer him the, the trade-off of having a blue that we would, um, that I would go with him. It was about quarter past four in the morning or something, and it was the middle of winter, and we've, a shocking night, and we've driven out and uh, come to a place and he said, well, you've got to hop out. And I said, what do you mean hop out? He said, well, you can't come. And I said, well, mate, I've only got my bloody pyjamas on. So he dropped me at a... Uh, While well, I was driving, I agreed to hop out and he, I curled up at a bus shelter, you know, shivering, and I had no shoes, no mobile phone. And I had every emotion that went through. I, I thought I, I was critical of myself of how stupid I was to do it. Um, I then thought, if he doesn't come back, you know, what do I do? Um, I don't fear the press anymore because we could not have had any more exposure than we've had. It's, it, that, that didn't. But I was thinking, oh, here there's, there'll be an article about you know me being picked up at a you know bus stop. Oh, I felt very scared for them both. You know, it was um, a very traumatic time. At some time in the morning, he he um, he arrived back with Brian. He was watching Dad go, and he was, and it wasn't affecting him. Like he, it didn't bother him, or it didn't seem to bother him. There's a definite, there is a definite point for me when drugs they go from being about enjoyment and, and escape, the release, to 
to turning on me, to, it's like self-destruction. You know, I'm out to wreck myself. You know, it gets, you know, that's, it's, it gets ugly. And I knew at stages of Ben's usage and addiction that I have no doubt we were dealing with a potential life and death situation. You know, it, it could have had that impact. And I thought, well, if I get this wrong, you know, I was in uncharted territory. I was just using my best judgment and speaking to the best people. But I thought, if I get this wrong, and I just think if I get this wrong, um, you know, we could lose him. I saw things that were happening to Dad and how it was breaking him and that still wasn't making... He still wasn't noticing it or he still wasn't fully understanding. And I thought if that wasn't going to, what was? I wanted him to see me as I was. I didn't want to camouflage it by taking, um, you know, particularly a, a tablet, but an antidepressant or anything like that. I wanted him to see me if it... <laughs> If it broke me down, I wanted him him to see me. I, I mean, we all were worried that Dad was going to have a heart attack or, you know, he he was, you know, I've seen him at points. I, I never, ever, ever thought that I would see my dad. Now, I made that judgment because of the, the bond that I felt he and I had, you know, because I thought it would eventually you know, get through to him, you know, that he was someone that was not only his old man, but his, his mate, his, you know, and his mentor. And if, if he saw it, you know, breaking me down, um, I just believed that it would be one of the things that turned him around. That's why I did it. I was happy just being a tearaway. I was happy feeding that uh, inadequacy, uh, lack of inner peace with with drugs, and I I I found fleeting moments, which which is all it is, fleeting moments of inner peace with drugs. Um, I remember writing him a writing him a letter once and saying to him that he had this amazing group of people because we'd had huge support from family and friends. I said, the only problem has been the only person who's not on this team is you. You know, I didn't know whether it was going to break Ben or Dad first. You know, I didn't know... You know, if I was going to lose Ben or we are going to lose my dad. My personal issues have really knocked my old man around and it, it caused him a, a, a lot of dramas and damage. You know, I can't go back and undo what's happened. I'll always regret what I've put my family through. We might make a move, mate. Okay, guys. Here, mate. Yeah, I struggle looking back at everything that's happened. You know, there is a lot of shame and regret I often think people wonder why I haven't broken down and cried. But my tears are something that I hold close to me. They're for me and my family. At the end of part two tonight, we'll find out more of what Ben Cousins and his family went through when Brian Cousins, Ben's father, joins us in the studio. Other special guests, including Ben's former coach, Terry Wallace, the AFL's Adrian Anderson on how Ben beat the system, plus a leading drug expert and an adolescent psychologist, will be here in the studio to answer your emails and tweets. That's straight after part two of this revealing documentary. After my major relapse in the middle of 08, I decided or, or knew that the only way out of this chaos and mess was to get back to training, to get fit and to rely on the structure and foundation that football provided. Where I seek stability and structure is with training and uh, you know, I'm a very self-motivating person and I wanted to keep the option open for football and, and even if football didn't eventuate for me, I knew that 
the benefits at the time of training, you know, far outweighed the effort that I was putting in. There's a type of player that will always get back. It's the one that's got massive belief in himself, a strong determination to succeed, and then most of all, a capacity to succeed. I see the three things coming together and I can't see any reason why Ben couldn't play. I think it'd be a real tragedy if Ben gets to a point, and we haven't seen this yet, gets to a point and doesn't make it back. I went down and trained with the Perth Demons, which is a waffle side, late July through August. I wanted to just reacquaint myself with the footy and get a gut feel for whether I, I had it in me to go around again and, and have a shot at playing AFL. I just felt for that entire year I was treading water without any ability to look into the future. And the idea of getting back to playing became a necessity more than anything because I feared for where I would be without it, where I would end up without the foundation of another couple of years of football. I was trying to run probably twice as hard as, you know, the other blokes. I saw it as the last week of training, so I just really hammered it. Oh. Yeah. I think we're going to put twice in. It's not a bad hammy. Well, yeah. It's good. They see it happen or they see it? happen like a hammy, but I didn't go. I just pulled up. Obviously still very important that, you know, it's kept private and, um, you know, it doesn't cloud um, potential footy clubs from you know, seeing me as as a possible draft pick. Where do you reckon I tore it? I reckon you tore it. There somewhere? You might have to go, if you can go running, you might have to go slow down a bit. Hello again, disgraced eagle Ben Cousins has met Collingwood coach Mick Malthouse for the second time in a bid to resurrect his career. The Brownlow medalist is said to be more determined than ever to play again when his 12-month ban expires. Are you feeling good in yourself, though? Yeah, feeling good, fresh. I just think it'd be pretty exciting to go to Collingwood and play for a year or two, uh, you know, in the big games in, in Melbourne. When it was known Ben Cousins and his management made it clear that he wanted to come back, I think all clubs had a look at him uh, because you'd be, you'd be absolutely crazy not to look at Ben Cousins. I met with Jeff Walsh and Mick Mouldhouse a couple of times. Yeah, I, I, I started to to really look forward to the prospect of hopefully going to Collingwood. Collingwood wanted Ben Cousins, but they wanted to minimise their risk. And whether it was right for them to actually go to the lengths that they did to uh, see what position he was in, um, I think I think that comes under the heading of due diligence. Yeah, the whole Collingwood saga and Christine Nixon and the coppers sticking their nose in and... Um, you know, giving their opinions on whether I was a viable, you know, prospect in the draft. Uh, I just felt it was a bit of an invasion of privacy. I, I thought it was a bit over the top. Collingwood certainly put a, had a private investigator, certainly got advice from the Victorian police that they probably shouldn't pick Ben Cousins up. Uh, I think that was well known within the industry and that acted for the research for many clubs. Gee, wouldn't you love to go to a football club that you find out later have had a private detective following you around because they don't believe a word you've said? Make you feel at home, wouldn't it? The fact that Collingwood got access to Christine Nix is very much an Eddie Maguire factor. He wields a lot of power in Melbourne. After all the you know, meetings and negotiations with Collingwood, they just walked away. Collingwood went to Perth to talk to him, and I think all they wanted from him was for Ben to convince them that uh, he'd be clean and that he wanted to play, and they would have grabbed him. But I think his own honesty came back to bite him in the bum, actually. 2008, there were a handful of times when I was required to go to independent doctors. There was three of them, two in Melbourne and one in Perth, and I went to them probably twice each. So that's six times I was probably drug tested. Come in and see the NHL, have a 
have six weeks worth of urine samples where I've provided at least two a week. But I was virtually left to my own devices and it was only towards the tail end of that year when I became serious or when they realised I was serious about coming back did I think they started to panic and think we've got to put him through a, a bit of a strict regime to, to see where he's at. This urine sample here would sell for a lot of money on the streets. <laughs> it became this is clean, this a real game of strategy because, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what the right thing to do was. I didn't know whether it was to come to Melbourne and get in people's face, whether it was to hang back and stay out of the public eye. Making the decision to go to the 2008 Brownlow Medal was in some ways a strategic one. Showtime. It was really important to look sharp and healthy and send the right message to influential people in the football industry that I was ready to go. The AFL expected me to come across um, in a way that gave the, or a perception that I was cured, that all my problems had been solved by this year off. Right through this process, I haven't bullshitted about my condition. To say, you know, I'm still an addict, I'll always be an addict, is not what they wanted to hear. But it's the reality. Ben, how's the rehabilitation going and do you think it's something the addiction you can get on top of? Yeah, it's, listen, it's going OK. Uh, you know, it's something that uh, I'm learning to manage. Um, you know, living with an overcoming addiction is... Um, you know, it has to be, it's, it's done on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, I think over the last 12 to 18 months, I've had the opportunity to step away from the football fraternity, um, reassess my life, um, you know, and regroup. Is Ben Cousins a risk in any way to an AFL club now? Oh, I think there's no guarantees in football. Um, you know, I've missed a lot of footy in the last year and a half. Um, you know, and obviously there's the associated risk with, with addiction and it being a chronic relapse condition. But, you know, I... You know, are very single-minded, and if I get given an opportunity, I certainly don't intend to let the club down. Choco, Ty, you've heard the interview. I think my life would have been made a lot easier if I just told a lie. If I said uh, my drug problem wasn't nearly as bad as it was, I, you know, I wasn't really an addict, but I, I had all these other issues that were going on. I'm fine, you know, I'll go to rehab if you want me to, but it's all cool. But my problem was too big, it was, it was bigger than that. Dear Andrew, <laughs> I hereby apply to the AFL Commission to be eligible to be drafted onto or included on a club's list in the draft for the 2009 football season. Submissions were made to the AFL Commission about playing again and our, our approach was that he ought to be treated like any other player there ought not to be any special conditions or special treatment given to him. Now I've had a letter to say that my rehabilitation has been minimalistic and uh, that, you know, I'm required to get treater reports from a number of doctors or psychologists. It's a bit, a little bit um, worrying that, you know, I, I may face the prospect of having to do a hair test and have my future decided upon it. The actual drug policy um, stipulates that you can play our game with a drug problem. Uh, the commission hearing required a, a hair test. I felt at the time that the AFL was out to set me up, but I was hell-bent on showing up to the hair test with hair that was going to be negative. It's grown. I'll tell you how much it's grown. Five. Hair grows at a certain rate. A hair sample, when tested for drugs by a recognised laboratory, can give you about three months' worth of uh, information. Well, I'd, I'd built up some um, some clean time and some foundation going into the hair test, but I, there's no question I was worried about the results of 
you know, three or four months of a hair test. It'd be a centimetre if it's straight, I reckon. I can't even have people knowing I've got a shaved head. All along, in my mind, I've been getting anxious over the commission hearing and whether the AFL was going to allow me to be re-registered. That was the big thing in my mind. It was never about getting an opportunity at club level. These people don't care about me. These people do not care about whether they find me hanging from a beam. They don't that. care whether I'm a fucking, whether I get back on the drugs, whether I end up dead. They do not care one bit. They sit there and go to me, when was the last time you used Ben? Mm -hmm. What do you say? Well, you what do you say? You have to tell the truth. Exactly. Yeah, Paul, yeah. Two seconds. The incident where Ben Cousins shaved all his hair off. Oh well, clearly he was worried that he was going to test positive, so he shaved all his hair off. Just a total smart aleck thing to do that really annoyed the hell out of the AFL and the Commission. I'm just saying the AFL requested a month ago. Okay. No, um, the AFL request, I'll speak to Greg. Uh, well, the hair test was classic Ben. He would have known that people would have checked out his hair length and he would have known that it was going to uh, prevent people from taking hair tests. And I think at that stage he was still had his finger up to part of the onerous elements that were placed on him. Oh, fucking oh, What a rollercoaster. Day of emotion. I'm cooked. I felt they were out to get me. I felt, um, you know, I didn't feel that they wanted me back in the AFL. I've been sitting here all fucking day, or all fucking. Oh. All month really what worry about this fucking hair test and uh <laughs> other than worry about other things that are fucking more important that was a torturous time for me. I had no faith in the AFL um understanding anything about addiction or what a possible relapse over those twelve months off meant rather than seeing it as part of my progress and, and the process I was going through. Ben Cousins is always headline news, but today's made good reading. According to Melbourne's Herald Sun newspaper, Cousins provided urine and hair samples two weeks ago. The urine sample is reportedly clear, and if the hair sample is also clear, Cousins' chances of being re-registered by the AFL will be significantly increased. The newspaper report Cousins is clean hasn't come as any surprise to the club most likely to select him, St Kilda. No, I just think he's committed. I think I think all uh, indications are that he wants to play footy and, and uh, obviously he would know he's being tested and, and he would know how important these results are. Post on Chris Medford Ross provided to the Commission. The AFL Commission has resolved the Ben Cousins application to be eligible to be drafted onto or included on the club's list for the draft for the 2009 football season is granted. Should Ben Cousins fail to complete a drug test, should Ben Cousins fail to comply with any instruction or direction of the AFL medical officers, or should Ben Cousins fail to comply with any of the other of these conditions, they may immediately suspend Cousins from playing AFL football pending the outcome of any investigation and or hearing. Uh, St Kilda Football Club is pleased to hear that Ben Cousins has been given the all clear to resume his career following today's AFL Commission meeting. The club will continue to follow its process of due diligence for making on the matter and will not be making any further comments. I guess the day of the announcement was just, it was just really intense uh, and very consuming. Uh, it was a big relief. And uh, the ironic thing about it is that I got re-registered as an AFL player and then had the, the bigger, even bigger battle 
of having to find a club. I'd had some interest from St Kilda right through the 12 months I had off. To give you an idea of how far down the, the track I got with talking to St Kilda as Ross Lyon came over to Perth and uh, he presented me with uh, St Kilda number nine Guernsey. I'm, I'm probably more excited about the prospects of going to St Kilda than I ever was of going to Cup yeah. America. Well, I've had a number of meetings with St Kilda, um, the most recent one being last night where I sat down with the football manager, uh, Matthew Drain and Ross Lyon, the coach, with um, the majority of the board um, of St Kilda. And, yeah, I think just sat down and had some formal discussions about the prospects of playing for them, um, really starting to warm to the idea of becoming a saint. Literally. <laughs> Who would have thought? It's never too late. Matthew Drain, the football manager, rang me and I assumed it was good news because it was a quick call and it was the exact opposite. And I must admit, I, people would probably think I'm making it up, but I was quite stunned and shocked and it took me a while to um, get my composure. And um, I'll, I'll probably be honest and say that I actually felt really bad ringing Brian and Ben and Ben um, couldn't speak either. And it was only when St Kilda knocked him on the head that I think the reality struck to Ben that Benny boy, it may not happen, mate. I think it was that was the only time that he faced reality for the first time in probably 20 years that things just didn't run the way that Ben Cousins thought they would run forever and a day. The decision was made based on you know good facts, good information, and and I think the right call in the end. But look, we hope he gets picked up because he's been very professional through the whole process. And, you know, we'd love to see him playing footy again and let's hope they can get a deal done at Brisbane. That hope was crushed this afternoon. The Lions issued a statement saying they would not be selecting Cousins in the national draft on Saturday. Other clubs are standing by their decision not to recruit the recovering drug addict. Cousins' last hope of playing in the AFL is the pre-season draft on December 16. It was just life sapping. It sucked the life out of me. I felt beaten. I don't think I spoke to or saw anyone for a week. I was just in bed and the thought of getting out of bed to the fridge or to get food seemed beyond me. His football career may be coming to an end, but his fight against addiction continues every day. After the show, Ben's father and best friend Brian will join us here in the studio to give us a greater insight into Ben and the family's fight by answering your tweets and emails. Also joining us will be a leading drug expert and an adolescent psychologist, plus the man that revived Ben's football career and his life, Terry Wallace. That's straight after part two of Such Is Life. I think he was overly confident. You know, you've seen him play. Even at 30, he's a good player. But even if you're a good player, people don't want your baggage, you know? So, and I kept saying this to him, you, you might be a good player and you might be all of those things, but you're at the end of your career and you're also somebody who's created problems. Why does somebody want to take that on? The stress and pressure that he was under, I, you know, I, I had grave fears for him. You know, he wasn't in a real good state of mind. He was stressed enormously and uh, I said, mate, I, I reckon the best bloke to ring is Sheedy. Kevin Sheedy was the guy that just got things moving in my direction. There was a thousand articles saying why I shouldn't get picked up, hair tests, this, that, you know, risks to sponsors, a thousand reasons. But there was also some reasons why I should get picked up and he was the one that just started to to drive that. So I said, if you turn up in Melbourne with a very aggressive nature that you're in right now, then you'll never play footy again, I can assure you of that. So I just jumped right on the front foot, which I probably shouldn't have. But anyway, that's what I did. And um, so I just tone it down, give me a little bit of less attitude and, uh, and maybe we'll reach um, some sort of pathway. I thought there was a, you know, let's call it a moral uh, side of it, that uh, if we could do something to bring him back into football and try to help save his life, 
let alone his football life and his existence and his, his work life, help save his life and help his family's life be any better. Not knowing the kid, I just thought that that was the right thing for football to do. And look, the, the club, uh, to a man, eventually uh, decided to give him that chance. 24 hours ago, Ben Cousins thought his AFL career was over. But today, in the last possible pre-season draft pick, it was revived. Player number 209. With that, the circus was back in town, and now it's headed for Melbourne. Yeah, I was the last player chosen in the draft in 08. Uh, I think it was indicative of my year. The one thing as a club that we had sort of said was, we're not picking him up unless he tells the truth. The club says it will not impose any extra sanctions on Cousins outside the AFL stringent drug testing procedures. Quite frankly, I, I would have been happy if they said they're going to test him every day because I, my understanding of him was that he needed a focus, he needed, you know, some control, and I was really hoping that, you know, footy would provide him with another opportunity. been waiting for. Fans liked what they saw, a staggering 1,600 new members signing with the club today. Look, he was good for them, there's no question about it. In commercial terms, he was good and he regenerated hope and the Richmond people, I think, to a person sort of adopted him and wanted him to do well. There's going to be a big crowd anyway, but I think there's a little bit more interest in it with Ben Cousins being recruited as a club. You know, it's been a long time coming and to finally get back out on the pitch and chase around the footy. In some ways, sort of, I think, puts a bit of finality to the last chapter of my life. Yeah. <laughs> She's come all the way from London to see you. I give myself every chance to play well and I understand that football doesn't always work out in fairy tales. The atmosphere here, Tim, is electric. It's got a grand final-like feel about it. I can't remember a round one clash that's had this much spoken about it. Ben Cousins in 2009 takes the limelight. It is an incredible sequence of events that's led us to this. I haven't seen hype in Melbourne about a footy game between two very lowly ranked teams from the previous year for a very, very long time. And, you know, they got nearly 90,000 people. It was just unheard of. It was an out-of-proportion build-up to round one and, you know, and I'd lived every minute of it, you know, it had been a year and a half coming. I wanted everything yesterday, I, you know, that's the way I approach my footy. He's, he's uh, in trouble. He's, done, oh, he's, he's got boys. He's in trouble. Ben Cousins looks like he has pinned the hamstrings. When he did his hamstring in that first game, you know, I can remember my heart sank, you know, but it was just think, oh, you know, where does this leave us? As soon as I saw him do that hammy, I thought, oh, shit, here we go. There's an indication that I'm not 25 anymore. Oh, I'm 30, I've had 18 months out of the game. The game may or may not have passed me by. If it hasn't passed me by this year, it'll pass me by next year. You know, that's life. Yeah, after I returned from my hamstring, I went on to play 15 games right through to the end of the year. Ben Cousins on the left boot. Just look at the players, look at the emotion in all that. As we get a year further away from that shitstorm, I have even greater appreciation for the role that Richmond have played in my life. And I say my life, but it's not my career, it's my life. Cousins, oh! Footy, as I said earlier, gives him the best opportunity of, of structuring his life the way that he as a person needs to structure it to help him to continue on, on, on this process. It's over! I 
I think the Tiger faithful will think of him as a Tiger for life. You know, I really feel that I've built up a genuine rapport with the players. Football's an emotional game, and that's the way I've played my footy. Terrific stuff, Sweeps a handle, take... Now, this year hasn't been incident-free. The old occasion in Sydney with a mate of mine, Dan Connors, when I got suspended for a week. I thought you were a dickhead, Ben. He's terrific. It's like a trip down memory lane. He's no has-been. Don't worry about that. He joins us in the studio. Welcome, Ben. Welcome, Jared. Boys. He's that bloody charismatic that he actually brings you into his world, no matter whether you're the, the 42nd player on our list or you're our best player. Unfortunately, I overdosed from sleeping tablets, found myself in intensive care. My first reaction was, I hope he doesn't die. The last four or five years has been about learning what I'm dealing with, learning how to overcome it, um, understanding the things that are potentially dangerous for me. But the Tigers have won it! Oh, that's the stuff that makes a footy club, doesn't it, and a team? Once the game day comes, it's like his show. He's ready to go, and it's like he's performing in front of 80,000 people. Now, Cousy, uh, this game's getting easy, isn't it? Mate, it's getting harder. I'm hanging on for dear life, I am. But, uh, you know, I think we're just starting to turn a corner, we're taking the first few baby steps, and the first few steps are beautiful. <laughs> Uh, I think Ben's very much like Peter Pan. Head versus head, that hurts. Oh, wow. Jack, thanks. So it's the last one up. This was a huge collision. The biggest question I have for Ben Cousins, what is he going to do when the rock star becomes grey-haired? We're all now wiser afterwards, and it probably what happened to Ben won't ever happen to a player at a club again. You know, I still, you know, I speak to him, you know, quite a few times a week and and stuff, but I, it's just the unknown of it. It's just not knowing what, what corner he's going to take next. Do you feel manipulated by Ben? At times you do. Do you feel like you manipulate Ben? At times you can. Most of us have got no idea who the real Ben Cousins is. I mean, I would like to see him. It's not necessarily contrition. It's not necessarily anything other than I, I just can't believe he's as strong as he's been through this. I would love to see him even look a tear. I mean, it might be silly, but just the symbolism of sort of saying, what have I done with my life? Or there was this dark period, or I'm sort of through it. One day he'll find out who the true Ben Cousins is. And when he finds him, I'd like to meet him. I wish it hadn't have happened. I wish he'd made better judgments, um, but that is him. He, he is, and he's made some shocking decisions in his life. And he's now got to try and put it all back together. And I, you know, I will support him in that, as Steph will and the girls and Matthew will. I attacked life. It was head down into everything. And that was my greatest strength. And we all know, none more so than myself now, that that approach to life is fraught with danger and it was probably only going to end in tears. <laughs>